Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to hear from two of our coordinators, Jesse and Angie. They have put this webinar together so we can all learn a little bit more about um, crisis situations that some of our students experience and how you as tutors can uh, respond uh, to these crisis situations. A few notes before we get started. For purposes of sound quality, all participants are currently muted. You may also wish to use headphones for better sound. This is an interactive webinar, so at certain points, Jesse and Angie will be asking questions of you. Please use the chat pane to get involved in the discussion at these points. Feel free to ask other questions at any time using the questions pane, although we will be holding those questions until the end. All right, thank you for being here, you two. I will pass it off to you now. Great, thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. So first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Angie Almendinger. I've been a regional coordinator with School on Wheels for about two and a half years. And I wanted to do this webinar because in my time with School on Wheels, I've really come to appreciate um, how much our youth are going through on a regular basis. And I want to let our tutors know how important they are um, for the health and the well-being of our students far beyond uh, simple educational help. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jesse Pasquin and I've been with School on Wheels since the beginning of this year. Uh, my background being in mental health, I believe this is a really important webinar and as a youth who also experienced trauma, I think it's important to utilize the skills that we have, pass them on to you so that we can keep spreading the word on how we can support our students. Before we dive in, I want to make sure that the goals of this webinar are expressed really clearly. Uh, students that are experiencing homelessness face a number of unique challenges that may affect their emotional well-being. High levels of stress, trauma, and the possibility of specific mental health needs can really affect their ability to concentrate on schoolwork, as well as how they relate with you, their tutor, during their sessions. Any of our students can experience unexpected emotional crises at any time. We're not here to train you on how to become crisis counselors or even to address specific mental health needs um, that would maybe require professional assistance. Rather, we're here to ensure that all of our tutors are equipped with knowledge that will help them to respond in a way that's more likely to benefit rather than worsen the child's crises. And that will help keep the lines of communication open with your student. The goals of this webinar are to develop a basic understanding of childhood trauma and how that might present itself in your tutoring sessions. That will assist, uh, will assist you in developing safe spaces. We're also going to outline techniques to encourage open communication and healthy boundaries. Uh, we'll be guiding you on how to identify the signs of crises and of course, how to address those during the session and steps to take after. Great, so let's get started with childhood trauma. Now, you may have heard of childhood trauma. Trauma is essentially the emotional, psychological, and physiological residue left over from heightened levels of toxic stress that accompany experiences of danger, violence, significant loss, and life-threatening events or adverse experiences. In simplest terms, children may experience or see events that cause a heightened level of stress. If that stress isn't alleviated, for example, by a caregiver, the strong emotions and the physical reactions that coincide with stress can persist long after the event. And these can have serious consequences for the child as they grow older. Some examples of experiences that may be traumatic are the ones that you might commonly think of first, such as neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, or emotional abuse. Other factors that might be traumatic for a child are having parents with mental health issues or substance abuse issues, or children that witness or experience family or community violence. For example, witnessing domestic violence committed against a parent, sibling, or experiencing it oneself, or witnessing or experiencing gang-related violence may be a traumatic experience. In addition, the sudden loss of a loved one and, you guessed it, poverty and homelessness may be causes of childhood trauma. Indeed, homelessness is very traumatic for young children. 
The loss of their community, their possessions, their daily routine, their privacy, and even their security can be extremely stressful. And it's a stress that's not easily alleviated. In addition, the stress that parents experiencing homelessness might feel is so easily absorbed by these small children. Homelessness can also expose children to additional traumatic experiences, and it may make them more vulnerable to violence or exploitation. In fact, children and youth experiencing homelessness have an increased risk for sexual exploitation. And in fact, if you'd like to learn more about the commercial sexual exploitation of children, we have another webinar on our website that you can take a look at. Children experiencing homelessness are three times as likely as their housed peers to experience anxiety, depression, withdrawal, and aggression. As you can imagine, these kinds of behaviors and manifestations of childhood trauma have a profound effect on how children experience their learning environments, both at school and in their tutoring sessions. The long-term effects on a child's physical and mental well-being are indeed profound. In broadest terms, trauma will affect abstract thought, logic and reasoning skills. <clears throat> children and youth may experience difficulty in controlling their impulses, regulating their emotions, and even connecting to others. On the right side of your screen, you can see a number of examples of behaviors that might be manifestations of trauma. For example, self-destructive behavior, angry outbursts, difficulty connecting with others, you may have opposing manifestations such as clinginess or standoffishness. Interestingly, factors like inattention, restlessness and hyperactivity, or learning difficulties are often associated with ADHD. However, more often than not, they are in fact signs of a child that has experienced trauma. Of course, it's really important to remember that everyone responds to trauma very differently. So the response that one child has may not be present in another or a child with trauma may show one of these behaviors or none of them or all of them. So it's really important to keep in mind that one behavior will not necessarily mean that a child has experienced trauma. Now, as you can imagine, the process to heal childhood trauma is often long and complex and can require professional help. However, there are certain things you as a tutor and we as adults can keep in mind to ensure that we're using a trauma-informed approach to your tutoring sessions or our relationships with children. Research has shown that youth who experience trauma may especially benefit from stable adult relationships and that they require an increased sense of safety and security in order to feel comfortable. By being a consistent weekly presence in your student's life, you show your student that you can be relied upon. This helps them build trust. By clearly structuring tutoring sessions, the student knows what to expect, and this can make them feel more safe. And by allowing the student to make choices during sessions, you empower them and give them a sense of control over the situation. Furthermore, for youth, it's important that they build a strong sense of self, and they develop skills to maintain healthy boundaries between themselves and others. By showing genuine interest in their skills, their hobbies, their opinions and their thoughts, you show them that they're a valued individual. Finally, helping a student to identify what they need, being it a tutoring break or a talk with a teacher or that they may need a new way to express themselves. You're helping, you're helping them to listen to their needs and to communicate these needs with others. This is the establishment of healthy boundaries. Now we're moving on to the first part of our interactive portion of our webinar. During this webinar, we're going to continue looking at one tutoring example, the relationship between Andrea, the tutor, and Andrew, her student. Let's take a look at this first example. Tutor Andrea has been working with her student, Andrew, for over three months at a local domestic violence shelter. Andrea considers herself a friendly person and has always been able to connect well with people, but she's struggling with Andrew. He rarely makes eye contact, he seems disinterested, and building rapport has been hard. This is your chance to share. Type in what you notice here in Andrew's behaviors and what you think Andrea should do to help make her student feel more comfortable. So we're waiting to hear back now just to see what we notice in Andrew's behavior. 
especially in light of the trauma that we've just talked about. Uh, I think something that I notice is that uh, Andrew has been uh, in a domestic violence shelter for three months. That could be something that's pretty traumatic for our student something mindful that Andrea needs to keep in mind. Right, that's already a, an early warning sign. If we're at a domestic violence shelter, most likely this child has experienced or witnessed domestic violence, which can be traumatizing. Uh, people have also chimed in to say they noticed he is distant, he seems withdrawn. Um, and one tutor uh, in regards to the second question says, perhaps Andrea should ask Andrew about himself, ask about his interests. Yeah, those are all great. I love all of the points that you brought up about um, about Andrew and what he's experiencing. And I think that's the first step into working with our students who are experiencing trauma is being able to identify those. Right. At the same time, we also don't want to just diagnose. Right. So we're seeing this disinterest. He's not making eye contact. Building rapport is hard. He's at a domestic violence shelter, which I think is a clear sign. But if that weren't the case, um, those kinds of behaviors could be presented in any child, even one that hasn't experienced trauma. So we certainly don't want to diagnose, but I think it's important to know that, you know, if you have a student that's, that's not taking a lot of interest in you or that might not be doing the things you would expect them to do, um, they might not just be belligerent. They might be actually having genuine physiological difficulties connecting with others. So I think that's um, it's good that we've noticed all those points. And I think that just helps us kind of understand the student a little bit better. Um, so in order for him to connect, he would need to be able to kind of relate to his to his tutor a little bit more. Um, and I think that's a great point that the tutor brought up is just taking an interest in who he is. And that actually is going to take us into our next part, which is going into more detail about creating a safe space. Um, students that are experiencing uh, trauma, they, they process these experiences differently. And we as tutors have the ability to support them. Uh, by creating a safe space for our students, we are helping them feel confident in their abilities without having to worry about harsh criticism or physical or emotional harm. Uh, so I kind of want to discuss some of the specific strategies that we can take for creating a safe space for our students. Our first one is going to be discussing structure and choice. Angie mentioned this earlier, and I think it's a great framework for us to have uh, in all of our situations with our students. <clears throat> for our students, life can be completely unstructured one moment, and then the next moment, their life is structured outside of their control. Many decisions are made for them, and they don't have the opportunity to make any choices about what they would like or what they need. A step that we can take here is incorporating a student check-in and check-out. I would suggest using the first five to 10 minutes, or maybe the last five to 10 minutes, to talk about your students' needs. Ask them how they're feeling. What did they do last weekend? What are some things that are contributing to their day? This will provide an outlet for your student to talk to you about how they're feeling. We've also mentioned taking a, a genuine interest in your student. This hour that you have with your student is their hour and their tutoring session, it's important to them, it's helping them. By taking a genuine interest, we are working with our students to make sure that they know they matter. I would suggest creating a session outline with your student for the hour of your tutoring. The important piece here is to design this outline with your student. Perhaps they don't wanna do that math worksheet right when you get there. Maybe they wanna do it near the end of the session. By allowing them to make a decision and giving them the choice, we are in creating a safe space and encouraging them. Encouraging them. Our last step towards creating a safe space is going to be our checking in and our opting out. Starting and ending your sessions with an opportunity for the student to express how they feel. We're also going to be providing choices for your student to guide the session and allowing the students not to do something by providing another option. I'm sure some tutors out there have experienced starting a session 
and you get the vibe that your student really just doesn't want to be there. And we can let them know that that's okay. We can work on something else, get to know each other, focus on something else that day. A way that we can do this is by creating appropriate opt-outs. Perhaps you bring multiple options to your sessions. You could bring some worksheets, an idea for an activity, or maybe a digital learning tool on your phone. Let the student know what you have and allow them to make the choice of how they'd like to proceed. On more challenging days, provide an opt-out that still allows time for tutoring, perhaps watching one of their favorite music videos or playing a game before we start working on a worksheet. You can also allow the student to complete a worksheet and we'll finish the session early for the day. These decisions will help create a safe space for our students. While we're taking those actions to create a safe space, it's also important that we monitor the language that we're using with our students. One way we can do that is by using open-ended questions. Open-ended questions aren't answered with a single yes or no, and it allows the student to express how they feel. An example could be, how are you feeling today? Or how did that situation make you feel? As opposed to yes or no, we might get some information from the student about how to respond to them in a future situation. I also want to encourage our tutors to use process-focused language as opposed to right versus wrong. When working on activities with students, avoid associating smartness with getting the answer right. Positively reward your student with affirmations toward their attempts and the process of working through activities. This will encourage them to continue making attempts and continue practicing skills rather than feeling defeated if they answer something incorrectly. And finally, we all want our students to feel safe, but we shouldn't assume that they feel safe. In times of stress or varying levels of crises, let your student know that they are safe within your company. They are free from harassment, they are free from harsh criticism or harm. So knowing what we know about creating a safe space, we're gonna revisit our example with Andrea and Andrew and see if we can help them out in a tutoring session. Tutor Andrea has noticed some significant improvements since she and Andrew developed a check-in and check-out routine. She took a genuine interest in Andrew's cartoon drawing skills. Sometimes Andrew does not want to interact. All in all, Andrea feels she and Andrew are building a positive relationships. So from this example, I'd like to start. Can, can anyone point out some of the steps that Andrea has already taken towards creating a safe space for Andrew? <laughs> so, so far, uh, someone has mentioned uh, the check-in and check-out routine as a part of that, those steps that she's taken. Yes, that's a great first step. And something to, uh, to recall is if Andrew doesn't want to interact, he then has an opportunity to tell Andrea he doesn't want to interact. Right. I always think those check-in and check-outs are just a great way to bookend your tutoring session so they know what to expect in the beginning and what to expect in the end. And that lets them feel a lot more safe in that space. Yeah. Yeah. Someone has also pointed out that she, um, that check-in and check-out has provided structure and routine for him and that she's Perfect. showing interest in him as a person. Absolutely. And that, that's going to increase the rapport and trust that Andrea and Andrew have together. Um, any suggestions for other steps that Andrea can take? Maybe Andrea can let Andrew make a drawing to express how he feels and what he's thinking. Someone also says you can, she can reward his drawings. That is great. Um, I think that really enhances the genuine interest that Andrea has in Andrew's ability. And it's a way that he can express himself in a way he mm -hmm. feels comfortable. And that's a great check-in routine as well. It's just if he's not someone that enjoys talking about his feelings, giving him a paper and colored pencils at the beginning of the session and just having 10 minutes of drawing is a great way to have a check-in routine that also incorporates his interests. 
Absolutely. So all of these steps that we have taken towards creating a safe space is going to enhance the trust that they have, and that relationship can or may result in some form of personal disclosure. Right. So once you establish rapport by building the safe space, con consistently building structure into your session, giving your student choices, having check-in, check-outs, and opt-outs, your student is more likely to see you as a trusted adult that they can confide in. In fact, you may be the only trusted adult in their life. It's so important to develop skills that will help keep these lines of communication open as you continue your tutoring relationship. If a student discloses personal information to you that's distressing to them, there are three things to always keep in mind. First, Listen non-judgmentally. A student's experiences may or may not be similar to your own, or they may describe situations that don't align with your personal belief system. Refrain from offering advice unless the student specifically asks for it. One quote I always like to keep in mind is, when I ask you to listen to me and you give me advice, you've not done what I asked. The next important step is to provide reassurance. Providing reassurance means showing your student that their feelings are natural without minimizing their importance. And finally, we want to empower and encourage them to find support by helping them identify what other support systems they have in their life that they can draw on. Let's go into each of these steps of listening, reassurance, and encouragement now. I've created a list of do's and don'ts when it comes to each of these subjects. When listening, it's important to keep an open body position. Try not to cross your arms and your legs. In addition, it's important to maintain a neutral facial expression and avoid showing shock or dismay. Even if a student tells you something very shocking or distressing, try your best not to express shock at this time. It can increase the student's sense of worry. Instead, listen carefully and quietly and allow the student to lead the conversation. As mentioned before, try not to offer unsolicited advice. A good way to respond to a disclosure might be, you seem upset. I'm here to listen if you'd like to talk about it. A way of responding that we should avoid is, wow, that's really bad, I think you should. In this case, you've really affirmed the child's worries and possibly made them feel even worse about the situation. You're also starting to provide advice that may not be needed. In terms of reassurance, let them know that what they feel is natural, normal, and that there is help for them if they'd like to have that help. Value their individuality and their experiences, and try not to assume that you understand their situation, even if it's something similar to what you've experienced. The way that they're internalizing that experience can be so different from the way that you have in your life. Make sure to validate and normalize their feelings and try not to act surprised or confused about the way that they feel. Everyone's feelings are valid. Finally, in providing reassurance, let them know that there is help, but don't make false promises. I think it's so easy for us to tell children everything will be okay, but it may not be. This is a false promise. Instead, let them know that there's help if they'd like it. In terms of normalizing feelings, you might say something as simple as, it's so understandable and okay for you to feel this way. Finally, let's talk about encouragement and empowerment. While your natural instinct may be to try and fix the situation, it's important that youth learn how to develop these skills themselves. This may mean asking if they've spoken to another trusted adult or a friend about what's going on in their life. This means helping them identify their support system rather than trying to fix it yourself. Often, youth may already have an idea of positive actions to take to help themselves, but they need someone to listen and encourage them to take these steps. So ask them if they have any ideas about how they can better their situation or the way that they feel. Don't make a plan of action for them. Let them develop that plan of action on their own. You'd be surprised how many tools they already have in their tool belt. 
Of course, whatever they decide, even if it may not be what you would choose, it's important to respect that decision. Some things you can say to them is, is there someone you can talk about this? An example of trying to fix it yourself would be, let me call my therapist in the school. They might know what to do. In this case, you've taken the power away from the student to help themselves. Of course, that being said, please keep in mind, if your student discloses information that leads you to suspect child neglect or physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, you must contact your regional coordinator immediately. Do let your student know what your obligations are as a tutor and what you're going to do so they're not caught off guard. Of course, as in anywhere in your life, if you suspect that a child is in immediate danger, call 911. Let's head back to our tutoring example. At today's session, Andrew is unable to concentrate because he's been bullied at school and he broke up with his girlfriend. He's been ditching his math class for the last week and doesn't want to return to school. He also mentions that he's no longer going to his after-school art program, which he used to love. In this case, Andrew is starting to disclose some personal information and some struggles he's going through. How should Andrea respond to Andrew's personal disclosure? And what steps do you think she should take? What you share could be as simple as some words she might use. I'm thinking that something uh, Andrea could do to respond is to let him know that the feelings he are ha is having, they're okay. And the experiences he's going through um, are okay. And the emotions that are coming from that are also okay. There's no point in this example where we should, where Andrea should be telling Andrew what to do with his girlfriend. Right, and that's what I think is interesting about this example is probably most of us at this point in our life have experienced a breakup. So we might think that we know what to tell him to make him feel better. Certainly something I've heard from people when they speak to teenagers is, oh, you'll get over it, it'll be fine. Um, but that's not something we wanna do in this case because that's not really validating how he's feeling or taking it seriously. For him, this is a crisis. So some of the themes that I'm seeing in uh, people's responses are uh, expressing that, you know, what he is uh, feeling is okay, and mm -hmm. it's normal to feel that way, um, and just to listen and be present for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly I think there's an opportunity to be shocked or even, you know, a student like this might feel that you're going to be angry with them for not attending school or not going to a program. You're their tutor. So they might be expecting you to be, you know, to be angry that he's not going to school. But in this case, we would really want to avoid injecting any of our feelings about what's going on and instead just kind of listen to what's what's happening with him. Um. And I think by doing that, you're going to, again, you're going to keep the, the space safe and you're going to continue to build that trust and rapport um, for the betterment of the continuing of tutoring sessions. There is one question that I think is worth mentioning. Um, someone has asked, can we ask him if he's notified anyone at school about the bullying? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, that's a really great question. So thank you for asking that. Um, I think that what's key there is asking him if he's notified rather than saying, I'm going to go notify or we should go notify. So asking him what steps he's already taken in the situation is a great way to start building a plan. And if he says no, then you could ask, is that something you're willing or have considered doing? That's a great way to let him lead the conversation. Right. Now, although in this specific situation where we're working to um, allow Andrew to open up and vent, there still might be situations in future tutoring sessions where a crisis does happen. So for our final step or our final part, we're going to talk about the crisis and how to respond. A crisis is a stressful time in an individual's life. And when they it's specifically when they experience a breakdown or disruption in their usual normal day-to-day -day activities or family functioning. 
um, there are certain elements to a call that might make this situation a crisis situation. So for signs of a crisis, uh, you might see these in your tutoring sessions that could include extreme non-engagement, withdrawing from that structure and routine that you built, um, noticing a very, uh, noticing a very obvious change in behavior, which could result in angry outbursts, yelling, or, or even crying. Um, while the crisis is going on, it looks similar to a mental health condition crisis, and I want to take a second to differentiate those for you. As tutors, we are not in a position to diagnose students with a mental health condition like depression or anxiety. Uh, crises can be the reaction to stress or change uh, and do not always lead to harm of oneself or others. The signs of a crisis may look very similar to the symptoms of a mental health condition, but as tutors we should only be responding to what is happening with the student in that moment. Let's talk about how we can address a crisis during tutoring sessions and then steps we can take after for continued support. But before we do that, I want to make sure that you know if a student does disclose information related to harming themselves or other, others, you must contact your regional coordinator immediately. Again, let your student know what your obligations are and what you're going to do. If the student you are working with is in immediate danger, please call 911. For responding during a crisis, we've put together three steps you can take during these sessions. First, I'd like to start with breathing exercises. These are best done with your student as opposed to telling your student what to do. If they are crying or yelling, it's important to know that this is a form of communication that we just may not be able to understand. So to help them calm and self-soothe, Ask your student if they would take a minute to breathe and calm with you. Assure your student that they are in a safe space in your company and you want to listen to what's going on with them. A simple breathing exercise is a 4-2 count rhythm. Inhale for 4 seconds, hold for 2, exhale for 4 seconds, hold for 2, and repeat as necessary as the student starts to self-soothe. You can also continue the breathing exercises with a 5-3 rhythm for continued breathing. Now, if a student is struggling to control their breathing because the crisis is preventing them from self-soothing, <clears throat> you can use grounding techniques to help distract the student from whatever trauma or crisis they are experiencing. One grounding technique is the 4-3-2-1 method. While you're both seated, Ask your student to tell you four things that they see around them, three things that they can hear, two things that they can feel, and one thing that they can smell. Encourage deep breaths between these responses. If your tutor tutoring location allows it, you can ask your student if they'd like to take a walk around. Ask if they would like to watch or listen to their favorite song. You can give a couple of options to the student to continue with our structure and choice method. Finally, finding help. Uh, I also have finding help in our next slide as it is a two-part process. Depending on the severity of the crisis and your tutoring location, you might need to find help sooner rather than later. We are defining help in this situation as the student's parents or shelter staff. Ideally, your first step is to calm the student, help them self-soothe, and then asking the student what they need for support in that moment and telling the student what you're going to do with that information. This is about building trust and rapport with your student and can be as simple as, now that we're calm, let's go get mom and tell her about what's going on. Or, thank you for breathing with me. How about we go get a staff person together and tell them about what happened? Now, after the student has calmed and they have self-soothed, there are steps you should take after a crisis. 
again, finding help from a staff or family member after the session and relaying the information exactly as it happened. It's very important not to use your own opinion or diagnostic language, simply relay the actions of the student and what happened. Then please contact your regional coordinator within 24 hours to brief them on the situation. Your regional coordinator is here to support you and can assist in those conversations between parents and staff members. After the crisis, you will return to tutoring and it is important to acknowledge that yes, a crisis happened, but you are not going to be dismissive towards your students' experiences. Continue your steps towards creating a safe space and incorporate techniques that worked during the crisis situation. Perhaps did the student respond very well to the breathing or grounding exercises? Maybe include that as a regular piece of your tutoring sessions. We're going to return to our example uh, and explore what happens between Andrea and Andrew in a crisis situation. Andrea notices that Andrew has been increasingly despondent. He is starting to withdraw and is less willing to speak with her. Suddenly, during the session, Andrew completely breaks down. He gets angry and begins to cry. He tells Andrea he is sick of his life and over it. Well, this is the meat and potatoes of our webinar, folks. So how should Andrea respond during Andrew's crisis? Uh, someone says express empathy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think also the idea of just being very calm. Yes, we're not we're not overreacting. We're not making a shocked face. Right. Uh, we're not closing off our body language. Mm -hmm. Those are great ways. It's important not to panic with a student. You might feel scared on the inside because you've never mm -hmm. experienced a crisis like this with your student, but on on the outside, just letting them know that you're calm and in control of the situation that can really help. Someone has also mentioned, um, ask him if he's thinking of harming himself. Yes, I think that's an interesting uh, comment. Uh, I think that that one also depends on how comfortable you feel asking that question. Um, certainly as, as a crisis counselor, um, we, we are trained to ask that question um, if they're thinking of harming themselves. Uh, I think it's an important question to ask but some tutors may not feel comfortable asking something like that. So that if you don't feel comfortable asking that, that's where you might say, have you talked to someone about this mm -hmm. feeling, that kind of thing. And that would be a situation as well, where if you do uh, think that self-harm might be happening to discuss it with your regional coordinator. Absolutely. Certainly it's something we wanna take seriously, but we also don't want to see um, you know, self-harm or, or suicide around every corner, right? We don't want to scare the child either. So taking it seriously, asking the right questions if you're comfortable, but then certainly um, finding the people that can help you if you don't feel comfortable answering those questions yourself or asking those questions yourself. Mm -hmm. And an attendee mentioned that the language does sound serious and so they would want to report this okay. crisis yeah. event yeah and that's if that's what they if they feel that this is a serious situation then absolutely um that being said again we want to make sure that andrew is a part of that conversation so we wouldn't want you to be with andrew not say anything and then go tell shelter staff parents and school on wheels this is a very private thing that he's told you about so it's important to let them know that you are going to share this with others you would love for him to be the one to share it you can go together that kind of thing. Giving him again that structure and choice to make a decision right. that will benefit Andrew. Right. And then the other theme I'm seeing in the responses is um, calming techniques. The Absolutely. breathing mm -hmm. techniques, um, those other techniques that you went over. Yeah, especially because we do see that Andrew has broken down and has begun to cry. Um, it can be hard even as adults to process things while heavily crying or feeling low. So just getting Andrew to a point where he can talk about how he feels and calming him with those breathings is a great first step. Right, that's really gonna help him communicate in a way that will be much more fluid for both of you. 
Absolutely. And those are certainly techniques you can use in your life as well. Which takes us uh, to a great transition of self-care and resources for you all as tutors. Um, obviously, while we're working with um, while we're working with youth that are experiencing uh, a crisis, um, you're using your mind, you're using your knowledge, you're using your energy to assist in the situation. And I'm, I'm, I can say without a doubt that Angie and I both know that this can be draining. And we really encourage you to perform self-care activities. Uh, while everyone experiences self-care differently, it's important to practice self-care techniques that build you up emotionally. Practices can include journaling, spending time with loved ones, meditating, or even using the grounding techniques that we discussed earlier. My personal favorite is walking my dog while listening to my favorite music. And uh, Angie enjoys taking runs along the beach. Yeah, or doing the dishes while listening to music, doing chores. Yes, yes. Can also can also be it has a twofold benefit. Exactly, <laughs> to be more efficient. <laughs> I also want to encourage all of you to revisit our School on Wheels online resources page. If you're on our homepage website, you can go to the Active Tutors tab, and the drop-down menu will show you the resources link. Please explore, as we have so many webinars and tools that can assist you in tutoring sessions. And finally, your biggest resource is your coordinator. At any time, please contact your coordinator if you have a question about your student or your tutoring situation, because we're here to help you and walk you through those situations. So finally, we just wanna leave you off with Andrea and Andrew. Now we've sort of gone through this whole process um, from building rapport to a personal disclosure to a crisis. This is kind of our ideal situation of what something like of this might look like. So Andrea listens to Andrew non-judgmentally, making sure she keeps a neutral expression. She reassures Andrew that his feelings are natural and asks him to take some breaths with her. After calming down, Andrea expresses her genuine concern for Andrew and her desire to support him. Together, they develop a plan of action for Andrew to speak with his mom. After the session, Andrea calls her regional coordinator and they discuss next steps. Oh, I just love ending on such a happy <laughs> note with nice? our students. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for participating today and for your wonderful collaboration. I really appreciated all the comments you were um, bringing to the table and the questions. One thing we do want to keep in mind is that Jesse and I are both continued, uh, continue to be available to you. So if you have any follow-up questions or concerns after this webinar about the subject, by all means, reach out to either of us for continued support, as well as your regional coordinator. Do we have any questions at this point in the webinar? There are two that were asked earlier that I would like to circle back to. Um, one question uh, asked by Catherine uh, Goff. Joff? I'm not going to try to pronounce last names. Sorry, Catherine. Uh, <laughs> uh, she asked, can we let him know that it is not okay to be bullied? A lot of kids might think that physical abuse is normal or that they somehow deserve it. I was just thinking that this goes along with empowerment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, certainly there are things that are not okay. Being bullied is not okay. Being called names is not okay. Being abused or neglected. These are things that are not okay. Um, I would certainly, as always, let him lead that conversation, but um, I think that's a really fair thing to say, is, you know, the way that these kids are treating you is not okay. So let's see how we can, you know, improve the situation for you. And not overstepping your role, saying that you're going to go to the school and make sure you're right, stopping right, this right, bullying, right. but of course, empowering him to find those healthy boundaries and how to uh, find the resources that he needs. Excellent. And then um, there was one other question. Someone was wondering if you would mind restating the 4321 sensory calming technique. Absolutely. Um, so, the reason that we have this method is not only is it going to distract from the current situation, but it's going to help them 
physically ground themselves um, so that they don't get caught up or feeling lost in all of the emotions that they're experiencing. This is going to tap into their different senses and bring them um, together. So that method, uh, the four, three, two, one, is four things that they can see around them. I can see pencils, scissors, cups, and a table right now. Three things that they can hear. I can hear myself talk. I can hear coworkers outside the door. And um, I can hear Angie breathing next to me. <laughs> Two things that they can feel. Right now, I feel how hard the table is that I'm working on, but the chair that I'm sitting on is really soft. And then, of course, one thing that they can smell. This may vary depending on your location. I'm currently enjoying a hazelnut coffee, and it smells delightful. Uh, wonderful, you guys. I think that is it for our questions. So that's the end. Thank you both so much for uh, being here with me and um, doing this presentation today. Uh, attendees, I hope you all enjoyed this experience. I know I did. Um, and I just wanted to kind of plug um, another webinar in the future. We are going to be rolling out our social and emotional learning program, which corresponds with a lot of the themes that we discussed today. Um, and that rollout is going to begin with a webinar next Wednesday at noon. Um, you can sign up on our website. Many of you may have gotten an email about it. Um, you know, during this webinar, if you were kind of wondering about other very simple structured ways that you could integrate some of these ideas and themes into tutoring sessions, that's what our social and emotional learning program is going to be. So I really recommend that you all hop on that webinar. Um, yes, it's June 5th, next Wednesday at noon. Um, details for that can be found on our events calendar. Also, I want you all to know that this webinar that you watched today will be uploaded to our website very soon. You will be receiving a follow-up email that's actually going to have a link directly to this once it's uploaded. So keep an eye out. Um, fabulous. Everyone have a lovely day. Thank you so much.